Hi, this is uh, Sri Chalapa with Engagely. I'm the co-founder of Engagely, a people and strategy uh, platform, a talent management system for uh, the hybrid workforce, as, like, as I like to call it. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Karen, who I met uh, online on, on LinkedIn, and I got fascinated by what she was doing. And this is a book that she wrote, which I am 90% of my way through, an excellent book on how to build a strong culture and a, pretty much a workbook on how to actually go about doing that. It's called Culture your culture. But without further ado, I know I would like to introduce Karen, but before that, I'm also joined with uh, Kip. Oh, perfect. Happy to do that, Sri. Thank you. And uh, thanks, Karen, for the invitation to join you all today. And thank you to all of you uh, who are uh, joining us live for this webinar or, or watching it uh, on demand in the future. Again, my name is Kip Kelly. I'm the Senior Director of Marketing at Sounding Board. Uh, we are the industry leader in scalable leadership coaching uh, with the world's first leader development platform that combines technology and coaching to drive measurable business impact. We have a leader development platform that's designed to, to lift the administrative burden for organizations, uh, offering coaching, making uh, leadership coaching easier to deliver, manage, measure, and scale. Karen happens to be one of our world-class coaches, and um, she extended the invitation to join today's webinar to talk a little bit about coaching and um, our approach at Sounding Board, and, and Shree was gracious enough uh, to have me on. So thank you both, and excited for today's conversation. Thank you so much for the warm welcome, Shri. I'll just share a little bit more about my background. I'm the principal of my own consulting practice. It's called Co-Design of Work Experience. Uh, I'm the author of... Uh, of Culture Your Culture, Innovating Experiences at Work. Thank you so much for the plug, Sri, there. Uh, I have a side passion project called A New HR. It's a future of work platform, really as a way of keeping in touch with what's next and what's new. Um, I, of course, also do executive coaching proudly um, with Sounding Board as well. And I'm a part-time instructor at Stanford Continuing Studies Program. Uh, I, I really see my purpose in life as enabling decision makers to address organizational challenges that affect uh, people in the business. So I spend my time mostly in uh, four buckets. The first is in coaching and developing leadership. Uh, the second is helping to, and enabling organizations to leverage culture, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, and employee experience. Uh, the third is optimizing talent. That's aligning people with strategy for results. And the fourth bucket, which kind of cuts across everything else, but is a whole lot of work on its own, is driving change management and transformation. So that's, that's where you'll see me most of the time, although I like to keep it uh, interesting and I get my hands in a lot of other different projects as well. So let's get started. I'd really like to hear first you know, why you're here and what questions you have. If you could take a second to just tell me a little bit about why you're here, what you're hoping for, any questions you, you're hoping to get answered today. I'd, I'd really appreciate that. So we've got one from Shana. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. She wants to continue and learn and grow and her ability to support employees and help them to learn and grow. Uh, Patricia's looking to always improve, which I think we can all right. relate to, especially these days where things are moving so quickly that it's important to kind of stay on top and always be um, uh, sharpening that edge. Absolutely. Well, we all are here to learn from one another, so I appreciate that. Uh, so, and guess what? Uh, some brand new content from me. So this is the first time I'm going to be sharing it in a public setting. So I'm excited to get into that with you as well. There's a couple of questions here as well that maybe you can address. Uh, sure. Uh, Rachel asks a unique approaches to virtual coaching and Deborah asks a way to convince senior management that coaching is critical to the success of their people. Um, I will have bits and pieces there for you for sure today. And what I'm sharing with you can be delivered in a, a number of different work arrangements. So it's, it's pretty universal. But if there's any specifics around uh, the virtual piece, by all means, I just um, actually did another webinar last week that was talking about culture and employee experience and DEI in the, in the virtual or hybrid work. So happy to share that recording if that's of interest as well. Okay, thank you so much for those questions. We'll make sure you, you have something uh, to walk away with in, that, in those respects, especially. Okay, so 
the other thing I, I thought we'd start out with is, and I think it'd be interesting for all of you to hear why we're talking about this topic and how this webinar came about. It was really interesting to me too. So Sri, would you like to share a little bit about how this topic became a focus? Yeah, so actually, uh, you know, we did a survey back in December on what topics would be of interest to our customers. You know, Engagely has about 450 clients globally. And one of the things that really stood out is coaching and mentoring were the two big topics that were right on top. Um, and then when I was looking around to see who I can invite to talk about coaching, and uh, obviously, uh, Kieran, you came at a first. So that's basically how we came to this. Um, so what was interesting is the world's changing um, and has changed during COVID. And the focus has changed quite a bit from focusing a lot more on driving, I would say, focusing on employee reviews and performance ratings and things like that to developing employees. And coaching has come up as one of the key methods to do that. Um, so I believe it's timely that we are doing this right now. From a sounding board perspective, you know, we are focused on leadership coaching and we've seen uh, unprecedented growth in this space over the last few years. Now, coaching is not new. Coaching has existed for decades as um, a bit of a cottage industry, but the, uh, the, the application of technology to enable coaching and to scale coaching, coupled with the pandemic and the shift to hybrid, has really accelerated that. Uh, and I think organizations are looking for uh, meaningful ways to support individual leaders um, and support them in in uh, a very personal way, in a, in a way that's relevant um, and, and kind of moving beyond some of the more one size fits all approaches. So uh, like you, we did our research, uh, a big research project just last year, and uh, we found that vast majority of organizations are offering coaching, and many of them are looking to increase their investment in coaching. And this was you know, during the pandemic, during a time when you know people were tightening belts and pulling back on other L&D. Um, they continue to invest in coaching and, and, and mentoring right now because I think of the, the quality of the development that it offers. Yes, absolutely. And even the comments earlier uh, made earlier by you and the audience around, you know, wanting to learn and grow and always be learning and growing. These are things that employees are asking for. There are reasons that they leave because they don't have those opportunities. So coaching is um, especially a powerful lever for helping people to learn and grow all the time. So what does real-time coaching mean? I always try to do a baseline or a foundation uh, level of understanding and a shared definition because I, I think it's really important to know kind of where, how we're conceptualizing it for this conversation. Now, most of us know what coaching means, but real-time brings it into the here and now, into the moment you know, that is our present. So pun intended here with the image. Uh, now, where many of us who get coaching, if we're lucky, right, on a certain cadence, you're having it for X many months, for a number of X many sessions on whatever timing you set up. Um, we're talking today about flexing those time-bound constructs and taking advantage of learning and development whenever and wherever we can, okay? So it's a shift from what's typically deferred as in scheduled coaching sessions, which are also really helpful, especially if they happen often enough to something that's a little bit more immediate or close to it. If you think about it, how many opportunities are missed every day? This is why adopting real-time coaching as another lever offers and delivers more gifts in our work lives. You know, So we're giving employees more learning opportunities, but at the same time, we're gaining more when it comes to talent development and obviously performance, okay? So this is not a new concept, by the way, as Kip said. Coaching has been around for decades, but so has real-time coaching. Funny enough, as I was preparing um, for this, I, I noticed and I did some research Around the same time a book called Real-Time Coaching was published, uh, Daniel Goleman of, at, with Harvard released this study that uh, leaders are ranked, I'm gonna quote this, leaders ranked coaching as their least favorite style, saying they simply didn't have the time for the slow and tedious work of teaching people and helping them grow. Okay, so that book came out around the same time as this um, the survey 
uh, was released or this risk report. So it just tells you a little bit about why you haven't heard about it as often. The thing is companies may have gotten away with neglecting this before, but it's now becoming an imperative. I think we all know that. Um, now, I mentioned earlier, employees are leaving companies due to the lack of opportunities for growth and development. Um, and according to HBR, again, now they're saying the role of the manager is that of a coach. So they, the evolution is happening the context is changing. Um, the pull to be able to use this as, as um, an approach in the workplace is uh, just simply to Kip's point, it's exploding. Now, the good news is that we all have the capability of adopting coaching behaviors. Every organization, every leader, all of us here. So why real-time coaching? Well, the first reason is, of course, that it works. All right. In my research, I found a case study by the NIH, and it was uh, called some, it's called a randomized control trial of real-time feedback and brief coaching to reduce indoor smoking. And guess what it discovered? It actually works. And so um, if they're able to take real-time coaching to address something as difficult as uh, people addicted to smoking and, and, and giving secondhand smoke to those around them, then we can do uh, we can do it. If they can do it, we can do it. That's the way I feel. It. So uh, we can help people become better leaders. Okay, and and this is why because it engages people, right? It, it brings us closer together. It's not just uh, a unidirectional. You know, we're giving this to them or they're giving this to us. We're we're working together. It's the us with them versus the us versus them. It lends support, especially where it doesn't exist today. It gives access to people. This is the thing is when people, and you see this with mentoring as well, only some people get it and others don't. When you adopt real-time coaching, you're giving more access to everyone. And that doesn't just hit the DEI dimensions. It's about making sure everyone has what they need to be able to be successful. And, um, and this is one I'm going to dig into a little bit more in the next slide as well. It, Real-time coaching utilizes and develops all dimensions of learning agility. And, and learning agility is what you do when you don't know what to do, all right? And so when you have that and you have the ability to shift and to learn in the process, that leads to change, progress, and innovation. That's something um, a lot of organizations are looking for these days. So the, the one thing that I, I think is reflected in all of those uh, characteristics is just the the relevance of real-time coaching, right? Really uh, focused on the flow of work. And I think that's happening across all of learning and development, trying to make learning opportunities much more practical, much more relevant to the individual in the flow of their day-to-day -day work experience. And I think that's the nature of, of real-time, right? Doing it right when, they, right when the challenge arises, right when the opportunity presents itself. Um, that's where you see real application happen and real, real change happen. Indeed. And that's kind of where that time construct kicks in as well, right? Because you're, you're having that happen and you're needing the agility to be able to do that. The Burke Learning Agility Inventory is something I want to expose all of you to and to share because it does clearly define the nine dimensions around learning agility. And if you look at even just the, the headings on the left side, uh, real-time coaching um, touches upon and develops each and every single one of these. So to, to be able to do real-time coaching is to become more agile in learning as well. So that's a huge plus. The qualities of coach, let's talk about this. And this is a non-exhaustive list. So I'm not gonna go into it in any particular order, but it, because it's, not, it's really specific to the situation and the people involved in each coaching relationship. But let's go through this. And But what, what you'll see is that you can actually reverse engineer this list based on what doesn't work, right? Um, a qualities of a coach and uh, is that you have to have other centeredness and empathy. So this should go without saying in, in the coach role, but I, I wanna be explicit about it. Um, and it's about, it's never about the coach. It's about the person being coached. Um, so the empathy is demonstrated by understanding others in terms of how they see things and communicating that understanding. That's what empathy is. It's not about um, seeing it from your point of view and translating it for them. It's to see it 
from their own shoes, right? The next is that um, really good coaches lead by example. They practice what they preach, right? So it's not, um, you know, do as I say, not as I do. Um, the coaches need to be the kind of leaders that they're trying to get people to become. Uh, Non-judgmental. So I always share this in my first meetings when I begin coaching with people. It's like, I'm not here to judge. It's not about what's good or bad, uh, or right or wrong, but what is effective or not effective from a values-based standpoint. Uh, and, and oftentimes people always try to accommodate for others. Am I giving you what I'm not? You know, it's, it's really not about that. I always try to make sure people feel comfortable being themselves, because that's when you have that safety established, then you're able to be vulnerable and to grow and experiment freely. Uh, coaches also to, need to be learners themselves. They have to be good learners. So it's not only uh, for their continuing development as coaches, I'm always looking to become a better coach, but to, um, like I said earlier, practice what they preach. And how could they otherwise expect those they coach to learn if they can't learn themselves? And a lot of what we do in coaching is not telling people, but showing them, helping them and facilitating the thought process by which they come to their own realizations and they can establish their own unique, authentic form of leadership. And that psychological safety is all important because if the safety is not there, then the change won't happen. And, and that changes what happens when you learn. And so it's really important that the trust is established between a coach and the person they're coaching, because otherwise it's not gonna, it, it's gonna be very limited in terms of the progress that they can make together. And that and I wanna point out that facilitates progress because um, you know, the way I describe it with the people I work with <clears throat> is actually based on the title of the book. It's Executive Coaching with Backbone and Heart. And you know that style ensures that the connection, the trust is there, uh, but that the backbone or the structure is just enough and the stretch is just enough so that that progress is actually not only obvious to themselves, but obvious to others and observable by them. One of the things that we hear about often that's been you know, written about extensively is how to create a coaching culture. Uh, and I think that that starts to extend beyond just professional coaching, the work that you and I do through um, sounding board, but to the individual managers and leaders serving as coaches and how to prepare those. And sure, you, you had mentioned it in our prep call as well. How do you start to prepare managers to have coaching conversations, to, to serve as coaches if they haven't gone through a formal ICF uh, credentialed Right. Uh, coach training program, but they are, but we want them more and more to serve as the coach in, in that role. I think these start to identify the qualities that you're looking for in a manager and a leader to be able to, to do that. I would also add, having been exposed to coaching is a great way to prepare them for success, to, to not just, you know, look for these qualities, but also to model that by introducing them to, to, to coaching in a more formal setting before you kind of set them off into the world to then coach their, their team. It's a great way to, to exploit these qualities. And assuming that they've got these qualities um, and that, that are already inherent, and then building on that with kind of some modeling of that and um, experiencing that firsthand. Indeed, I totally agree with you, Kip, on that. Um, it's, you know, that helps build that empathy piece even strongly, more strongly having gone through the experiences themselves. So um, I think coaches uh, would benefit most by having been coached before. And I, I myself included, as well as a lot of my other coaching colleagues um, also have our, our own coaches. Um, and I know with sounding board, we have the experience of doing a lot of peer coaching as well. And that's something we do um, because we have the heart for it. Um, we're willing to give of each other. So th that's what I love about the sounding board community, Kip. I just wanted to put a plug in for that as well. I appreciate that. <laughs> I, I have a coach here as well. I was meeting with my coach earlier today and I, I would say it's great to be coached, but it also is a nice reminder of how I want to be more intentional about how I'm listening and leading others to insight, whether I, you know, I'm wearing the title and the hat of coach or not, it's always just a good, good to keep those um, behaviors top of mind. And I find working with my coach is a great constant reminder of like how I want to be 
a better leader and, um, and a better manager. And the other thing I want to emphasize is, again, all of us here have the capacity to learn to become really good coaches as well. And it doesn't, you don't necessarily need that badge to say that you went through uh, this training or that certification. Um, it, you know, the important piece is, is making sure as a manager or a leader or somebody who, who leads programs that support coaching or even uh, those that are trying to drive a coaching culture. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, it, it's really important that we all have that capacity to bring about progress and change in our own organization. So never feel like, you know, it's too big for you to tackle. Uh, one person, yeah, you can't own your entire organization or your entire culture, but one person can indeed make a difference. So let's talk a little bit about the values related to real-time coaching, okay? And I'm going to tell you because this is only a start because the rest is up to you for you to incorporate your own values as well. But these, the ones of these lists that I'm going to go through uh, that I will review is they're all really good for all types of coaching, but I want to highlight them as especially needed for real-time coaching. So the first is mindful. Um, and that's it. That is paying attention in the present in a non-judgmental ways. And, you know, when I went through to find the icons and the images for this presentation and I looked up mindful, you, you get all these images about calm and meditation and, and um, you know, uh, water. And, and it is all those things. But mindfulness is also about paying attention in that present in a non-judgmental way. So, so that's why I have this like intention focused uh, piece for mindful because I, I want that often gets forgotten when people think about mindfulness and that is a key part of being mindful. The second is emotionally intelligent. I'm going to spend a little bit more time on this one. Um, it's defined by two conditions and it has to hit both. One is to recognize and understand emotions in yourself and others and to use this awareness to manage your behavior and your relationships. So in Emotional Intelligence 2.0, they point out four key skills required for EQ. Things like self-awareness, that's the ability to accurately perceive your own emotions in that moment and to understand your tendencies across situation. So that includes you know, staying on top of your typical reactions to specific events, challenges, and people. Things like your hot buttons, like knowing what they are is really important because then you can do the second skill, which is self-management. And that's your ability, um, your awareness to use your, that awareness to uh, stay flexible and to direct your behavior positively in a way that's productive. And so that means managing those emotional reactions to situations and people um, and getting those results by putting your momentary needs or reactions on hold to pursue larger, more important goals. And the third skill is social awareness. That's the ability to pick up on emotions in other people and understand what's really going on with them. This is that empathy I was talking about. Um, and it's often um, requiring you to perceive what other people are thinking and feeling, even if, especially if you don't feel the same way or you don't agree. Um, so listening and observing are the most important elements of social awareness. So that's, again, where mindful comes in as well. The last one is uh, relationship management. So that's your ability to use your awareness and your own emotions of, the, of others to manage those interactions successfully. Um, I, I work with a lot of people that come to me and say, okay, I want to increase my influence. Influence has everything to do with the relationships you have with people. And if you don't have those relationships, you don't have the influence. Um, so when conflict comes up, and sometimes it does, um, those relationships make all the difference. So relationship management is so important to that bond that you have with others over a period of time. It's not the transactional piece. It's the connectivity between people. The third value I want to cover is affirmative. And what I mean by that, and that comes from appreciative inquiry, okay? It's a difference between what's affirmative and what can be a destructive conversation. They're meaningful. You know, they're mutually enlivening and engaging. Um, they generate information, knowledge, and possibility. They're a, they, they focus on the solution or outcome. They're positive and productive. 
Now think about all the conversations you've had that are affirmative and compare those to those uh, that have been destructive. And those are based on a deficit um, based form of thinking. So there's blaming, disempowering, claiming authority, you know, otherwise minimizing the worth of others. We've all been on the receiving end of that. Um, arguing or debating without listening to one another, bullying, commanding and controlling, strict advocacy with no inquiry about what others are thinking. I'm sad to say that destructive conversations are also given in the form of feedback. And guess what? It doesn't work. So affirmative conversations are so important for creating the possibility and that growth and learning and stretch. And, and, and speaking of inquiry, you know, what does that mean? It, it means generative questions that bring about new learning and possibilities. So some examples um, that pulls out the best of what is and what is what might be is uh, to ask somebody, if we were to start over from scratch, what would you do the same or differently? Or making room for diverse perspectives. What worked well for you? So hearing it from someone else's perspective. Um, surfacing new information or knowledge, like I said. So what's more, what's the most important when it comes to this? So you know what, what's behind, what's driving and motivating. And then stimulating creativity and innovation. I mean, this, there's this, uh, this great um, device that is used in design thinking is to start everything with how might we. That stimulates that creativity that invites people in and engages them. One thing um, I'll add, you know, yes. one of the things we hear uh, with our clients and even talking to others in the industry, the term feedback, a lot of people like to now start using the term feed forward yes. because, they're really, because they're looking at solution and not necessarily analyzing and blaming what happened in the past. Big time practicer of feed forward over feedback. That last value here I just want to cover really quickly um, is uh, learning centered. So learning tends to be iterative, okay, not, so we improve every time, so long as we're kind of reviewing and trying again, experimenting again and again, um, it requires reflection. So you all know that if we don't have time to pause and think about things, it, we're not going to capture all the learnings there. So it's important to be learning centered, to, to use reflection to help us solidify our learnings and to process them. And learning doesn't happen unless you demonstrate it by change behavior. And, that, and like, that's the distinction sometimes when we talk about training. I mean, you might go to a training. You might get that used to be that you used to get a binder and you put it on the shelf and never touch it again. Or you take a, a webinar <laughs> and never listen to it again and don't think about it and do, do nothing different afterwards. That's not learning, okay? Learning is always demonstrated by change behavior. And that's why so much of learning is about transformation and vice versa. Transformation is also about learning. So I, I thought I'd share an example of approach of an approach because everyone's always like, give me examples, give me examples. And I think the sounding board way is a great example. Um, now I'm happy to speak to all of these, but I think Kip uh, can do a better job than I can. So I, I think it's uh, important to stress that uh, our technology platform is agnostic. So uh, it's an open platform and you can use um, sounding board coaches. You can use your own internal coaches. You can enlist external coaches and they can all coexist within our leader development platform to support your coaching engagements within an organization. Um, when you choose to use sounding board coaches, uh, and I think we've got some of the best coaches in the world, uh, we, true, we, we do try to, um, uh, try to stay uh, consistent with the sounding board way. Um, that's how we recruit our coaches um, with, with kind of this vision, these values in mind. And it's the, the, it enables us to provide a consistent coaching experience across an organization. So if we um, enlist coaches who have great experience and then we continue to invest in their learning development, what we call Sounding Board University, to continue to uh, support them. That provides, I think, a better uh, coaching experience where they are focused on it. And you'll see, I, I won't read all these, you all can read at home, uh, but we focus on leadership and leadership development and uh, the impact of the leader within the context of the business. Now, this is an example, as Karen said, you, you might have a different set of values based on what's, what works for your coaching practice, if you're an individual practitioner or what works within your organization. These are the values that we've embraced because we focus on uh, coaching in service of leadership development, 
and coaching in service of business outcomes, really driving for uh, organizational impact. So you'll see those reflected in the values um, that, that are expressed here in the sounding board way. Yes, and the reason why it is called Sounding Board is, is, uh, way is because it's unique to this particular organization and the way we do things. Um, and so if you want an example of approach, this is something you need to define for yourselves. So what is your approach to coaching? And um, this, this, I can tell you, is one way that works really well. So it's a great example. Thank you so much, Kip. So let's get to the heart of it, the meat of it. Like, how, how, do, you, how do you create that? real-time coaching experience. And, and I, I say very specifically here, and this, is, this follows through as a common thread in my culture work as well as it's about co-creation. Uh, now, before I get into the details here, notice the ecosystem or the, the conditions that are needed in order to support successful coaching in real time. So you see all that surrounds that, that one yellow dot where the coaching actually happens. Uh, let me go through and this is brand spanking new i wanted to share with you first is articulating the starting point um, getting that baseline of the where somebody is beginning their development or where they are today um, and identifying that gap between where you are and where you want to go and sometimes assessments help with that um, there's other and different ways but it, and it has to do with different degrees of self-awareness and that's where self is, those assessments come in or the or the 360s come in or what have you. And we do this at Sounding Board as well. We gotta know where people are starting. We have, because if you don't know where you, you're starting, um, you can't get the directions on how to go get to where you're going. So it's like, I give this analogy all the time around the GPS, you know, how can you get the directions if you don't know where you're starting and where you're going? It's just getting those addresses down, so to speak, uh, to be able to understand and map out that journey. Okay, the second is establishing goals. And that's to ensure progress. If you don't set goals, the research says, if you don't set goals, you're not likely to make as much progress. To, so again, knowing where you're aiming for and how you articulate them is going to be really important to making sure that uh, even coaching in real time is successful. Agreeing on the boundaries, what's in and out, including how it's different from training, mentoring, or counseling. Um, it is, you know, this this is what we mean by coaching. And this is what, where we want to coach and where we don't want to coach. Those are examples of boundaries and, and what works for somebody in the way they learn or hear things and, and versus how a coach might be able to share or communicate things. All of that is about understanding what the boundaries are in the, and the construct by which people are coaching um, or, or experiencing coaching, negotiating that agreement. So taking that knowledge on those boundaries and negotiating the conditions where there's always gonna be that willingness to offer and to accept that coaching. What conditions were, does it, does it make sense and make most sense? And where does it not? You know, how are we gonna work together? Um, how are we going to demonstrate the principles and the values of this coaching experience, all that. And then that, that goes between manager and employee as well. Um, and oftentimes when you don't have that social contract, so to speak, uh, you find that people learn the hard way, a lot of trial and error, and it doesn't always go well. So it's always great to negotiate that up front. Then you get to the actual coaching, and we're going to get into this in a little bit more detail. Um, but coaching is about leveraging that coaching itself and the behaviors that are associated with coaching and the culture in which it happens. Measuring, everyone loves measuring. They tend to do it in a quantitative way. I'm going to tell you that qualitative is as important, and it can even be more more stringent because it's a pass fail if you think about it, right? Is it good or bad? Was it helpful, not helpful? Was it effective, uh, not effective to somebody's uh, leadership development? So uh, you have to measure, you have to know, and I'm not just talking about utilization. Again, that's another thing you just focus on that. You gotta, you have to focus on uh, the outcomes of that experience and those interactions. So uh, measuring is really important because it also allows you to scale and sustain. Scaling is multiplying, extending it and granting it that access to, to more and more people and sustaining it is supporting, reinforcing, tweaking it, course correcting it uh, to make sure that it continues and you're building that momentum. That's actually one of the areas that I think has been most interesting over the last couple of years with the application of technology 
bringing in more measurement and more, which, which brings more transparency and accountability. And then also bringing in the administrative side where you can scale and sustain. I think the challenge with coaching historically has been that it's a bit of a black box in organizations or at an individual level. And um, it's, I don't think anyone's doubted the efficacy of it. It's always been uh, considered a, you know, a highly, uh, a highly valuable tool for development, but nobody could really tell you how. Um, and now with, uh, with, with kind of advances um, in, on the technology side, you have really good data on the impact of coaching, the measurable imp improvement over time at the individual, at the organizational level. Uh, and now you have the tools and the resources to then extend those benefits to much broader populations. I think that does go back to one of the earlier um, bullets here in terms of establishing the goals and the boundaries, because as you scale, coaching is then available to people who may not have been introduced and might not necessarily understand what coaching is or why coaching is. And I, I, I worry now within the industry that there's some, uh, you know, com coaching gets conflated with counseling or with therapy because you see, you know, some of these companies are leaning into resilience and well-being. And there's a place for that. And I'm not saying that coaching can't be um, powerful there, but um, I would, uh, you mentioned this earlier, Karen, I'd say it's important to understand what is coaching and and what is it not? It's it's not necessarily a counseling or a therapy session. It's not necessarily um, a consulting session. And I've had worked with some coaches who are just fantastic and also can serve as consulting, but it's a very different outcome. It's a different conversation. Um, so it's important to have those, uh, set those expectations to have the, mo to, to then be able to, to uh, deliver the best quality coaching experience. Yes. And I can speak to that as both a coach and a consultant. Those are different modes of operating and it's a different engagement or, or relationship that you have with the others that you're working with indeed. So um, yeah, it, that's why it's so important to make sure that these conditions are in place to experience and co-create together. If you notice, this is all done in, in tandem with one another to make sure that coaching experience is in fact having the impact and the relevance that people need and their organizations as well. I'm talking about this even between formal coaches or as well as those that are managing their direct reports and having that coaching relationship as well. Since we're getting into the meat of this and we're, I'm about to dig into the coaching in real time process, uh, I wanna also let you know that even though this is a webinar format, um, to, to make sure that if you do have questions that you do take advantage of the Q&A, um, we're going to have time at the end to hopefully address some of that as well. Okay. Um, and all of this, by the way, just to, to touch upon the question that was raised earlier, can be done virtually. You see nothing here that requires any sort of specific type of work arrangement um, when it comes to whether it's face-to-face -face or are totally remote, okay? Anywhere and anything in the middle as well, that hybrid piece. So let's dig into that one point around coaching in real time. So what does that mean? So let me just start by telling you, there are double loops here in between each of the different steps because um, it's iterative, it's part of learning, as I said, and it's also the permission to double back if you need to do it um, to, to be able to review and and reinforce, okay? So it's not just iterating for learning, but also doubling back and making sure you did it right. Um, the first is uh, observe. So this is where mindfulness comes in, that paying attention bit, where you can only observe that uh, learning opportunity if you're paying attention, right? Uh, the second is construct. Rather than reacting in the split second, which becomes emotionally charged sometimes, a coach should have that presence of mind, that EQ I talked about, to process first, conceptualize and name what's going on, incorporating it into their own thinking and putting their own thinking, uh, the perspective of the other person, and then the context that they're working within. Okay, that's really important to make sure some sort of mental model or construct of what's going on is, is understood. And you're inviting them to validate and to make sure that that's the right time and place to do it. Um, so that harkens, harkens back to honoring that social contract that I just talked about uh, on the boundaries and negotiating of that agreement um, that, that they work together on. Under what circumstances and how the coach and coachee are both willing and ready for that coaching. 
So it may happen in that moment, or it might happen immediately after that moment, but that they have an understanding of making sure it's happening at the time, right time and place and in the right way. The next is engaging. So remember showing, not telling, I told you earlier. Um, so it's about engaging with one another and the coach asking questions to cultivate learning and development. So questions like, what did you notice? Why did it happen? How can, how can you improve? So again, showing, not telling, helping people process and to come to their own realization. Um, and, and the coach might offer what, what, I, what Sri queued up earlier, feed forward. So feed forward. <clears throat> now, feedback is typically um, either right in that moment or in the past, but feed forward gives feedback for the future. So it's different than setting expectations. It's more about helping somebody uh, develop and do better. Um, so it's an affirmative approach, same thing like, like affirmative conversation. It's an affirmative approach over that deficit-based approach um, so that instead of helping um, proving people wrong, you're, you're helping them make it right. Do you see the difference in the framing there? Um, and it can come from anyone that wants to give support in the re receiver's best interest. That's the agenda, the other person. And, and people tend to, and I noticed this as well, people tend to accept feed forwards um, much more easily than they do feedback. Um, and, and they don't take it as personally as well. And by the way, feed forward is so much more powerful because you can't change the past. You want to empower people to do better in the future. So it really, really is a very powerful to think about using feed forwards more often than you do feedback. The next step is commit to action. That's the action planning piece. And when you're doing that, you're also committing to the change behavior that demonstrates the learning I talked about. So what are you gonna do different next time? Um, what, do you, what are the promises or the commitments that you make to yourself as a leader? Um, those are examples of commitment to action. Can we use our goals? Can we refer back on, we have a leadership roadmap in, at Sounding Board where we actually track that journey and that process. And, and that, that captures the short-term, the medium-term and the long-term development for that person as a leader. And then this last step, which you know is so often forgotten, which frustrates me because it's probably one of the most important steps is a, because following up allows for not only reflection, but accountability. So after that learning happens is, well, how did it go? Um, do you have any other thoughts around it? As you review what happened, as you reflect upon it, um, what can I do to continue to support? That follow-up is so important because it allows you to go back and observe again and see if that progress has been made. Um, and I'm not talking about just the coach, but the person being coached as well. Let me leave you with some tips on bringing real-time coaching into your organization. And that addresses the, the question that was asked earlier at the top of the session. So build um, an internal business case. So we, we, we've given you the external business case, lots of research out there, um, lots of anecdotal evidence as well, but, but you need to build an internal business case tied to what your organization is trying to achieve and how real-time coaching is gonna help you achieve it. That's an example, um, but you wanna be able to build that internal business case for, that's specific to your context. You wanna create and connect it to the culture, and then co-design the employee experience to reflect that, coach, uh, that culture. And this is where um, my framework, Design of Work Experience, that I write about in Culture Your Culture comes in. It provides the step-by-step -step how to for creating the culture and the employee experiences where both business and people thrive. And so if you say, we want to go about creating a culture that is more coaching-oriented, um, it has to be specific to your unique context. It's not, you do what everyone else does. There's absolutely no differentiation in that. And second, you can't expect that doing the same thing in different contexts is going to kind of come out the same way. So being very context-driven is very, very, very important to making culture successful, culture as an asset. You have culture, whether or not you're paying attention to it. The question is, is it working for you or working against you? As you build the case or you roll out the changes or the culture and the experience, you know, if you need to pilot it, okay, there are certain companies, 
uh, context that that need to learn that way or to build the case that way. So it's not that you can pull the trigger and everything happens and changes overnight. You can't you can't um, flip that switch. But piloting might help you get the learning you need to allow you to tweak it along the way to make sure that it's going to be successful as well. And leveraging available technology. Now we've touched upon this all along the way. I am of the mind that in my fields of coaching and consulting, that technology has a role to play uh, with human touch to be able to um, build better progress. And I know this, I incorporate technology wherever possible. That was uh, one of the reasons I joined Signing Board is, is to be able to be on that front end um, where we're seeing how technology can enable, enhance, automate, drive, um, drive these experiences to even greater heights than we were able to before. So uh, I'd love for, for, the, the, for the two of you to talk a little bit, because you're both technology companies, uh, Kip and Sharice. I'd love to, to have you uh, talk a little bit about your points of view on this particular um, bullet here. I'm happy to chime in. And then Sri, I'd love to hear your perspective. From a sounding board perspective, it's still about um, putting the, the leader first. And the technology is an enabler, but it's still driving a uh, human engagement, a, a, a personalized learning and development experience. So it should be a supporting mechanism for that. Um, and there's a lot of technology out there. I've seen it over the last couple of years, just an explosion in technology and the, the broader HR technology um, uh, category, but also specifically in coaching and mentoring and some really valuable and, 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 and uh, interesting tools there. Um, but I, I would also say that technology can be an encumbrance um, if it's if it's about the technology and there's some app based coaching out there that's that has no human involvement and there's a place for that I'm not I'm not I don't mean to diminish any of that um, but what we do is still very much focused on human to human coaching whether it's our coaches or organizations and really trying to bring out the best in that um, to prepare the coaches and the coaches with the resources that they need to to have a really um, valuable coaching experience. So that means the, the data that you mentioned earlier, Karen, um, the, the knowledge and the insight before they even come into the coaching session, and then the, you know, supporting that throughout with insight and data to really make for more rich, insightful conversations. That's where I think technology is really uh, playing an interesting role, bringing um, not just transparency and visibility and accountability, which I, I mentioned earlier, but also just making coaching better because now you've got this this co-creation space where a coach and a coachee can um can you know keep things top of mind can capture insights when they happen can record goals and accomplishments and progress towards those goals all in one spot um not to say that that wasn't happening before but it wasn't happening consistently uh, there wasn't really a platform to do that for you know all of the different coaches working across all these different engagements. So it's really exciting to have the the tools and the resources all in one spot, and that's why what I think is driving so much of this hyper growth in the space the the use of technology to not just scale but to scale in a way that's uh, creating a a richer experience. Our uh, approach on technology is well, we are in a hybrid world where majority of the companies or many of the companies have pretty much permanently moved to hybrid workforce of technology almost becomes kind of necessity at this point. So now then how do you use the best form of technology to do that? Um, so, you know, we have basically two separate set of tools. You know, one is focused on performance related coaching. So that's real time feedback, being able to give feedback at any point. Um, and that's not just from manager to employee, but from peer to peer as well. Um, and that, you know, and that can be anonymous. Uh, you can give it where it's only between you two and nobody else can see it. So things like that to make it a little bit more effective uh, and protect the privacy, if you will, to some extent. Um, the other aspect really is around uh, mentoring, which is uh, sometimes conflated with coaching. Uh, and mentoring is a separate platform that we have within Engagely suite of products called Mentoring Complete, which is uh, focused on building uh, internal mentoring programs that can be scaled. Um, as well, and that's follows very similar principles that uh, you mentioned Kip, as well in terms of setting mentoring goals, which are fundamentally different than your work-related performance goals. Um, so that's uh, so those are some of the some of the tools that are available. Yeah. And I think whether we use uh, Zoom or Excel or whatever, you know, we have to use some tools these days because of uh, the preponderance of technology and the move to hybrid workforce and 
using some of these tools that you know that that uh, sounding board has or engagely or mentoring complete has really makes it more scalable and manageable um, and consistent as well right um, and effectiveness can be measured better uh, by using those tools so if you want to do this at scale uh, I, I I think technology is is almost imperative yeah absolutely and and, and also is reassuring that no one needs to start from scratch there, right? Um, there's exactly. a lot of support needed in terms of that. And the last point here is just sustaining. As I said earlier, as it comes to sustaining learning on the coaching and relationship side, sustaining the programs and the coaching behaviors that you need to keep it as a cultural norm. You know, this is not a flavor of the month thing. It should not be if you really want it to work for you. Before you make your first meeting or you plan and go ahead and make your decision, I want you to ask yourselves these questions first, okay? Uh, because these are what should be behind everything else, because otherwise, again, we, it's not about just execution and, or just the transaction. It's about the relationships and the connectivity between people. That's really important, especially when it comes to virtual uh, relationships, working uh, conditions, et cetera. So think about that before you operationalize it. And I want to thank you all uh, for joining us today. And if you have time for any questions or to keep in touch with me, I really invite you to be a part of this dialogue with us. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Shree, for the invitation. This has been uh, a delight. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks a lot, uh, Karen. Appreciate it very much.